You're listening to the Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible podcast with Dr. K. Episode number 18, part one. Dear Neuro Careers podcast listeners, it's time for us to dive in again into the exciting field of careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies. In podcast episode number 12, we talked to Thomas Feiner about neurofeedback. And this episode of our Neuro Careers podcast was the most popular among any other episodes this year. And in that episode, we learned just a little bit about a possible conjunction between the neurofeedback and meditation. And we also learned that there is the whole institute of neuromeditation that is led by Dr. Jeff Tarrant. That's why today we have Dr. Jeff Tarrant as our NeuroCareers podcast guest. So let's welcome Dr. Jeff Tarrant. Thank you so much, Jeff, for coming to our podcast. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Can you please briefly introduce yourself and also tell us where are you joining us from, from what part of the world? Yes. Well, you know, thank you for inviting me uh, to be on your podcast. I really appreciate it. It's nice meeting you. And I am joining you from Eugene, Oregon in the United States. A brief introduction of myself. So my background is actually in psychology. I'm a counseling psychologist, but I've been in the world of neurofeedback almost from the beginning of my career. So probably starting in 1997 or 1998. I've been in the world of neurofeedback, but at that point, it was largely just from a clinical perspective for treating ADHD or anxiety or depression or whatever. And I still do a little bit of that. But the other part of my life was in kind of more of a meditation track. Um, So I, I studied Zen Buddhism and very interested in Taoist practices and Qigong and Tai Chi and studied various other traditions, Vipassana and Arhatic Yoga and various things. So meditation and mindfulness and assorted contemplative practices have always been an important part of my life. And so, of course, when it became sort of obvious that we could combine these things, the two things that I really love the most, that became sort of an obvious sort of direction for me. And so I've always kind of dabbled in that. How can we use technology to enhance our meditative practice, our internal awareness? But really, it was about six and a half years ago that we formed the Neuro Meditation Institute and said, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is our primary focus. And so since that time, we've really been developing approaches to teach other people how to do this so that it's not just people coming to our office, that we can kind of teach other people around the world how to use these approaches for themselves. Yeah, thank you very much. We are exploring in our podcast, where does the desire to develop certain career is coming from? And it looks from what you just told us that you always had some type of desire to help other people in one way or another. If being a clinical psychologist uh, or working with neuro uh, meditation, neurofeedback, then meditation, neuromeditation, how did you become aware of of this need for you to contribute to uh, and to help other people do you see that something was already apparent maybe in your childhood um and how did they develop into your decision to do the things that you are doing right now yeah um actually i can identify a a time period in high school um so many years ago now And I think I was a junior, maybe, so 11th grade, 
And there was a, I was a very small high school, kind of in the middle of nowhere in Missouri. I lived in Missouri for most of my life in the United States. And the guidance counselor at the school had this course. It was a, a peer education course. I can't remember exactly what it was called, but something about it caught my attention. And I think she only took maybe 10 people or something. So the whole course was about kind of learning how to be a peer counselor. So kind of helping your peers with whatever problems they were having and doing educational things for the school and the community. And I loved it. It was a pivotal time for me because up to that point, I'd been a bit of a troublemaker and <laughs> it was a little bit of a surprise that she let me in to the class. I was shocked, actually. So this was kind of the moment where I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. I want to help other people. And at that point, my interest was focused around helping teenagers with drug problems. Gee, I wonder where that interest came from. I don't know. But so, you know, obviously looking at my own struggles and challenges, and then it's like, oh, I want to help other teenagers with this area. And so, you know, really, I mean, I went to college. I never changed my major once. I majored in psychology. As soon as I finished my undergrad, I went straight to a master's program in counseling, went straight to a PhD in counseling. So there was never really any kind of shift. Once I kind of decided what I wanted to do, it was a very clear path for me. Now, I never ended up doing drug counseling with adolescents. Um, so that part changed, right? You know, like once I got into the field and started understanding other ways to work with people and understanding other issues, then, you know, things kind of shifted and moved. But it's interesting because I knew nothing about neurofeedback, especially at the time I was coming up, nobody knew about neurofeedback. It was something that was non-existent or very minimally existent. And so that part was, was different because I learned nothing about it in graduate school, didn't even know about it. And actually, it was, it was after I graduated with my PhD, I had a part-time position at the counseling center at the university that I went to. And I found out that they had a biofeedback lab upstairs, kind of hidden. Nobody knew about it. And they had this old technology, probably the first neurofeedback machines that were ever built. And they were very primitive. But when I understood what they were supposed to do, that was very interesting. I was like, wait a minute, what? You can change your brain? What? You know, and to me that as soon as I heard that, I was like, I want to do that. And so it was another one of those things where it was like, as soon as I heard it, I knew I had to do it. And then, you know, just figured out how to make it happen. You know, found some training, took out a loan at the bank and bought some equipment and, you know, basically didn't look back. So, yeah, so my path was a little bit different probably than a lot of people's because it, it, it was fairly directed. Yes. So fairly straightforward, but still you were... Uh, looking for something that actually wasn't really very much used, uh, something that was just starting, yes, neurofeedback. And probably this is what ignited your interest also in, in the brain in general, because neurofeedback obviously is all <laughs> a lot about the brain. Another thing uh, that wasn't really very popular, <laughs> probably, uh, was meditation. So how did uh, you come to the meditation? What made you interested in it and what ignited that interest in you? You know, I, I grew up and I went to school in the Midwest in the United States. And this was in, you know, the late 80s, early 90s. And yeah, there was not a lot of meditation happening. It was not like things are today. So, you know, I, I really knew nothing about meditation, but as an undergraduate, I started taking religious studies and philosophy courses. So some of those exposed me to Buddhist and Hindu ideas and ways of thinking. And, you know, that really resonated for me that just the philosophies behind that made a lot of sense to me. They really struck home in a way that more Western religions never really fit for me. I Christianity just never made sense to me. 
But then when I was exposed to these Eastern ideas, I was like, oh, this is great. Okay. But it was all very academic, right? This was just a class. And so it was just learning about the concepts and learning about the philosophy. And so, of course, the next thing was like, well, how do I, what am I supposed to do? Like, what, do you know, <laughs> um, because both Taoism and Buddhism in particular, you're not praying to a God. That's not really the way it works. It's, it's more about understanding your own connection to nature and re- understanding that, that you're a part of nature and that you move in the same cycles as nature. And so learning how to sort of work with that movement in some ways, very practical, right? Practice, but it's like, well, how do you do that? So then it was like, oh, I've got to learn how to meditate. I, you know, I have, that's obviously a big part of these traditions. And, you know, initially, again, I was in the middle of the, of the Midwest. There was nothing there. So, you know, I'd go to the bookstore and go to the new age section, because that was the only place you could find anything about meditation. And I'd read some books and I'd try some things. I had no idea what I was doing. And then eventually I found a Zen monk. I just found him. Uh, He actually was a professor at the university and taught in the English department. He taught poetry. And he had a small Zendo that he ran out of his house. And he didn't advertise anything. He didn't. But I I, kind of found him. And so I started sitting at his house. And, you know, there was usually only two or three people there. And then once I kind of got into it, yeah, I was like, okay, this is for me. This is good. And then, of course, times changed, right? And so mindfulness and meditation became much more common, much more popular. Mindfulness-based stress reduction started popping up all over the place. And even in Missouri, there were other options. And so then I could explore a bit more and learn some other, you know, traditions and other ways of practicing. Yeah, thank you very much. And now when you already found uh, neurofeedback and you found uh, meditation, when did this connection between them come in place? Uh, how did it happen? And uh, basically how the neuro meditation, this concept was born? Yeah. And what's interesting is that I, I didn't know this right away, but as I began learning about neurofeedback and learning about the history of neurofeedback, turns out neurofeedback really was created for meditation. So in the 1960s was when some of the first systems were created and people that were experimenting with it were using it to try to get into deeper states of consciousness. And so literally the very beginnings of neurofeedback were connected to meditation. Now that's good and bad. I mean, obviously there was a connection that people made at the beginning, but it was oversold, I think, at the beginning, right? That it's like, here's the solution to all of our problems, right? Like everybody needs to get into an alpha brainwave state, whatever that is. And, you know, and of course that's not going to solve all the problems and that's not how everything works. So this has been a part of the neurofeedback world from the very beginning. So, you know, really it's not like I created something brand new. I'm I I'm really learning from the people that came before me and, and, you know, maybe advancing it a little bit based on new information because, you know, the early approaches to what I'm going to call neuro meditation, they weren't calling it that, you know, in the early days, but it was basically alpha, you know, uh, reward alpha in the back of the head. And up until recently, that has been the approach like, oh, meditation with neurofeedback, alpha. Alpha up, alpha up, you know, and it kind of makes sense. But what's interesting is that, you know, alpha is going to increase when you close your eyes. Alpha increases when you are relaxed. And so that's great. um, But that doesn't necessarily mean you're meditating. And there's lots of different ways to meditate. And different ways of meditation influence your brain differently. So kind of just having this one approach to, you know, increasing alpha is really not enough. And now we know a lot more. And so, you know, we can expand the way that we're working with it. So I never answered your question exactly. So the way that this got connected was I was aware that people were doing this and I tried alpha up and I was kind of like, eh, 
you know, and partly it didn't work for me because I've already got a lot of alpha. I've already got a ton of alpha. So I can't really make my alpha go any higher. It's it's already about as high as it can go, right? And so so it didn't really make sense to me. I was kind of like this, okay. And so I, honestly, I just kind of stopped trying because I was like, I don't, okay, like, I don't know, maybe this isn't for me, I don't know. And then it was much later that started looking at the research that had been done by other people looking at what's happening in the brain with meditation and really looking at how the technology had advanced and was like, you know, wait a minute, we we can do a lot more here. I think there's other approaches that we could try that might be useful. And so that's how it happened. You know, that was the beginning for me. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's uh, so interesting that you said the most the turning point for you was when you saw that there are many other uh, changes in the brain uh, that are happening during the meditation. And actually, they can vary from one meditation to another meditation. That's what you say in your written book, which explains many things about the meditation. I think for, for the beginners, even, it's it's a perfect tool. There are different changes uh, which uh, not many people know. I think we are blending very often uh, so many things in just that one uh, definition of meditation or, or into that one word. Maybe you can talk to our listeners and tell them uh, about different types uh, of meditation and also about the brain changes that are associated with those different types, that it's definitely not just alpha, it's much more, and now our technology allows us to know and to use this. Sure, yeah. And yeah, I agree with what you're saying that, you know, and, and we kind of think of the, the term meditation as being really sort of an umbrella term uh, to kind of capture a, a variety of uh, types of states of awareness. And again, I don't want to pretend like somehow I figured all this out myself because there's lots and lots of researchers who have found pieces of this. I, th I think what I did or and what our, our group did was kind of organize the information in a way that we just kind of put it together in a way that it makes sense. But, you know, lots of other people were responsible for figuring some of this out. And so if you look at the research literature, you'll see that, they use terms to describe certain kinds of meditation, like focused attention. So that's one that you see a lot. So I'll talk about that one first. Now, we just call it focus, but you'll see the other people call it concentration practice. It's all the same thing. This is part of the problem is that there are different terms being used to describe the same process. So for us, what's really important is examining how are you directing your attention and what is your intention? And so those two things, attention and intention, seem to be kind of the key to different types of meditation. And of course, if you change how you're directing your attention or you change your intention, it changes how the brain is engaged or not engaged. So for a focus practice, you know, you're holding your attention usually on a single target. So the breath, a mantra, an image of the Buddha, whatever. And that's it. You hold your attention on the one thing. The mind wanders and gets distracted. You notice that the mind wandered and you bring it back. So, it, you know, it's a very common practice that everybody is kind of aware of. It's a foundational practice in many ways. And so anything that has that basic formula can kind of be called focus because it's involving the same brain networks. And it's asking you to do the same thing, which is hold your attention in one spot and not get absorbed in other thoughts or mental activities, right? That, that involve you thinking about yourself. And so really what's happening in the brain is two things, which is another important thing because a lot of the uh, technologies that exist for measuring meditation in the brain, they tend to use kind of, you know, a simple headband EEG device. And I'm not picking on any of these companies because I think they have something to offer that's beneficial. But if you're only looking in one spot, so on the forehead, you're actually missing 
um, some really important parts of the brain for meditation. And so, you know, if, if, you, if you're not looking, you're not going to see it. Um, but what we know is for a focus practice, yes, your frontal lobes need to be involved and they need to be active, actually. So it's not like all meditations are about being quiet and in this alpha, theta kind of brainwave state. Because if you're sustaining your attention, if you're holding your attention, that requires activation. And it requires your frontal lobes to be engaged. So the frontal lobes are engaged, but then at the same time, the default mode network is quiet. And that's in the back, you know, the hub of the default mode network is more in the back of the head. And so again, like if you're not looking in the back of the head, you're going to miss that information because that's really where the hub is. And of course, the default mode network is mostly involved with us thinking about ourselves. So we want that to be quiet. So you actually need one region of the brain to be active and one to be quiet at the same time during a focused meditation. Other meditations are, you know, again, like if you look at the research literature, you'll see the term open monitoring a lot. And they abbreviate it as OM, which of course is confusing because it looks like OM, right? OM. And it's not, we're not OMing, it's um, open monitoring. And really what they're talking about is I think what most of us think of as mindfulness, of being aware of your thoughts, your feelings, your body sensations in the moment, but without attaching to them. So seeing what is happening, noticing your thoughts, noticing your feelings, but letting them go. So open monitoring, you're aware, but you're just kind of like, you're more in an observer mode. So that's a different type of attention than focus. And so even that little distinction, you can see that it's like, it's not actually the same thing. There's a, there's a little bit of a difference. And they're related to each other. They tend to go together, but they're different. And so not surprisingly, when you look at the brain with more of an open monitoring or what we call mindfulness in our program, when you look at what's happening in the brain, there's a lot. There's a lot going on. In fact, this is probably the most confusing of the, the styles of meditation because there's a lot of different ways to engage in mindfulness, right? So are you paying attention to what's happening in your body in the moment? Okay, well, that's gonna involve certain brain networks. What if I'm paying attention to what's happening out in my external world in the moment? Well, that's mindfulness too. Well, what about a body scan where I'm directing my attention to what's happening in the moment? Well, that's different too because it's more directed instead of, more of that open awareness. So all of these little variations of what we think of as mindfulness actually change what's happening in the brain a little bit. So the two areas that do seem to be the most involved with mindfulness, one of them is the same as focus. You're quieting down the default mode network. So that's a pretty common theme that goes through most meditations, is that you're not supposed to be thinking about yourself. That's like a basic foundation of most types of meditation. I mean, we'll see in a minute that there are exceptions to that rule, but mindfulness, you're, you're not supposed to be thinking about yourself. You're supposed to be aware of what's happening in the moment, which also involves the insula. And the insula is a deeper structure in the temporal lobes that is very much involved with, it's, it's a big part of the salience network. You know, salience, what is, what's important now? And so, again, it's one of those weird ones where you're quieting down one network, but you're activating another one at the same time. So this is kind of what we start to see is that with most of these meditation styles, you're, you're quieting down the self-referencing, but then it's like, well, but then what are you doing? Okay, if you're not thinking about yourself, what are you doing? And so that's what kind of makes the difference. Is it focus? Is it mindfulness? Is it quiet mind? Quiet mind is another one of the styles that we, we talk about. and you know, this is more like what you think of with transcendental meditation or Zen, where there's kind of nothing going on. It's pretty quiet. So it's another one of those kind of stereotypical ideas of meditation that somehow your mind is empty. There's no thoughts, there's no images, there's no words, nothing. So obviously, if that's going on, everything should be quiet. So this is kind of the exception to some of those other ones. Yep, you're quieting down the default mode network. You're kind of quieting everything down. Like you shouldn't be thinking about anything. 
So everything is, is sort of squashed a little bit. And then the fourth style that we talk about, we actually talk about five, but mostly we talk about four, is open heart. You know, most people are going to be more familiar with the terms loving kindness and compassion. That falls in this category for us. We use the term open heart to be a little more inclusive because there are other meditation practices that might involve things like gratitude or joy or awe, um, forgiveness that still seem to fit into this category, but they're a little different than a traditional loving kindness practice. And so this is the one that's the exception to the rule. Uh, there's actually no areas that are disengaged in this practice. There's a bunch of things that are engaged, but the default mode network actually doesn't get quiet uh, during these practices, which makes sense because you're, you're, you're involving yourself. If I'm wishing you love and kindness, well, I'm involved in that, right? There's me, Jeff, is involved in that practice. So, the, so that means the default mode network is as well. So, you know, there's actually an activation of several areas of the brain. And you see that in the research of like uh, Richie Davidson at the University of Wisconsin. He, he's done some great research with Tibetan monks doing a compassion meditation. And this is exactly what he found is nothing gets quiet. In fact, you see these big increases of gamma brain waves, which are the fastest brain waves. And so that's the stuff that makes the headlines, right? You know, when you see those things that say, monk has the fastest brain waves ever recorded kind of thing. And, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a little exaggerated, you know, like media is, but, but the point is accurate, which is that these monks show a really dramatic increase of gamma, which is the fastest brain wave that we measure generally speaking. And so, uh, you know, you're activating the insula again, because the insula also has to do with empathy. It also has to do with emotions. So you're activating the insula, and then you're also generally activating the, the left frontal lobe of the brain, which is associated with more of an approach motivation. So moving towards something. So it's like, you know, you're feeling loving and kindness and generosity, but your energy is moving toward another person or a region of the country or whatever. So in general, those are kind of the four styles that we, we look at. Thank you so much. Uh, I think now it's more clear for people who want to start meditation. I actually, after Thomas Feiner's podcast, I received uh, some emails asking to suggest how to start meditating. So now based on all this information that we have, that there is no one type of meditation, what would be your just initial answer to those who are uh, asking uh, for this? How to start meditation? <laughs> Which sounds very broad. <laughs> it, it, it's a great question. Um, I, I was smiling because it seems like it should be an easy thing to answer. In fact, if you pick up a book on meditation or you go to any class on meditation, they're going to say, here's how you start. Sit, find a place to sit that's comfortable, cross your legs, sit up straight, do the, you know, whatever. They're going to give you very specific instructions. You know, I smile because our approach actually is pretty different because we tend to try to encourage people to experiment. And so, yes, you have to start somewhere, right? But we also want people to sort of understand that meditation is really about your state of consciousness. It's not about how you're sitting or what you're doing. It's about your state of consciousness. And because we're all different, it kind of makes sense that the way that I meditate may not fit for you because you're a different person. Your brain probably operates different than mine. So why would you do the exact same thing that I do? That doesn't make sense. And so, you know, we really want people to find a way to approach meditation that works for them. And let me clarify, because what I'm not saying is just do what's easy. Uh, I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is, uh, let me give an example just to make it simple. So let's say somebody is listening to this and they listen to the four styles and they say, oh, you know, I think I should try a focus practice. Okay, fine. 
What most people are going to do is they're going to sit down and they're going to watch their belly expand and contract. They're going to, you know, okay, I'm going to watch my breath. That's what all the books say to do. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, if you're like most people, you can do that for about 10 seconds and then the brain wanders off and then you drift off into fantasy and and thinking about your day and worrying about the state of the world and whatever. And 15 minutes later, you realize that you're supposed to be meditating and you're actually just daydreaming. And, you know, and then you go, you know what? I, I can't meditate this. I'm, I'm terrible. at This This doesn't fit. And then you quit because it's like, this doesn't work for me. And so in my mind, it's like, well, it's not that meditation doesn't work for you, but maybe that's not the best approach. Maybe you need something to help you be a little bit more engaged at first. Because honestly, sitting and watching your breath is about the most boring thing in the world. You know, I think about it sometimes. I'm like, why would we ask people to do that is the very first thing. That's like, that's horrible. It's like torturing people, right? And so instead, it's like, well, why don't we make it a little bit more engaging? Why don't we make it easier at first? So we like taking sort of a developmental perspective that, you know, if somebody's learning something, you don't ask them to do the hardest thing first. You, you, you baby step it, you make it simple. And so, you know, we talk about things like, well, maybe you should add movement or maybe use a guided meditation, something that's helping you along. You know, we have techniques like layering that we talk about where you're kind of adding different elements into the meditation. So it's more engaging. So again, let me make this more practical. So if we're talking about a focus meditation, so instead of just sitting and watching your belly move, you could stand up. And, you know, at first people are kind of like, what? You can't stand while you're meditating? I was like, Why not? Who said you can't stand when you're meditating? Uh, in fact, in Qigong, that's how you meditate. It's always a standing meditation. Well, usually. So there are traditions that stand during meditation. Standing is already more engaging. So if you have a tendency to fall asleep or to get dreary or, or kind of like your mind gets kind of uh, distracted or whatever, well, do something that's more engaging. Stand up. It's already going to activate your brain more and make it easier to stay on track. Then you could just do a simple movement. So, you know, simply raising the arms up around the body with the inhalation and bring them down the front of the body with the exhalation. So it's a very simple, repetitive movement. I'm still watching my breath. I'm still watching my breath, but now I'm bringing my body in with it, with a movement. It's way more interesting. It's way more engaging. It's going to be way easier to stay on track um, with the practice. And then a layering technique would be, okay, well, now we've, so we've already layered one thing. We're watching the breath and now we've got movement. So there's two elements that are working together. So that's, that's layering, but we could also add a cognitive element. So we could say, okay, now count your breaths. Okay, so I inhale, my arms come up. I exhale, my hands come down. That's one. Inhale up, exhale down. That's two. Count up to 10, go back to one. So, you know, some people might consider this kind of cheating, right? Because it's like, well, you're you know, but in my mind, it's like, well, the main issue at the beginning is not to get caught up in other thoughts. And so, okay, well, so give your brain something to do to help it stay engaged. You know, now over time, as you get better and as your brain gets stronger, because this is exercise, it's, it's, you know, it's like going to the gym for your brain. So as your attention gets stronger and your brain gets stronger, well, may maybe you don't need as much. Maybe you can let the counting go. Maybe you can let the movement go. You know, maybe you can do three minutes while you're standing and then do three minutes sitting. So this is kind of my point, right? Is that it's nice to try different things and then reflect, you know, so this is an important part for us as well is to really examine what just happened when you did your meditation practice. Did that work for me? Why, why not? What was it like when I stood? What's it like if I lay down? What's it like if I do it with my eyes open? What about with my eyes closed? What if I use this hand mudra? What if I try a different hand mudra? And so really 
Like instead of trusting what somebody else says and thinking that that's the answer, listen to yourself. Try different things. See how it feels. Does it help you get into the right state of consciousness? If the answer is yes, keep it. If the answer is no, throw it out. And so, you know, I mean, even the Buddhist, you know, said this. He's like, hey, I'm not saying this is the way to do it. He's like, try it. It's an experiment. Try it. I'm paraphrasing. I don't think the Buddha said it this way. But, you know, it's like, if it works for you, great, keep it. If it doesn't work for you, then don't do it. That just makes sense to me, right? And so starting, you can start anywhere, right? It's like, start somewhere, pick something, try it, reflect on it, keep your expectations short, small, right? Like, don't try to do 40 minutes the first time you practice, you know, maybe do three minutes and do three minutes every day. And then next week, do five minutes, right? We know that consistency is more important than the amount of time. So doing it every day is way more important than trying to squeeze in 40 minutes. And just to kind of, while I'm on this kind of tangent, most people who are doing 40 minutes of meditation are not doing 40 minutes of meditation. They're sitting there for 40 minutes and they might be meditating for seven minutes and they might be mind wandering for 33 minutes. So in my mind, it's like, well, why not just really do your meditation for five minutes and then be done? Uh, Why not just be efficient? (laughs) And then develop it over time. You were listening to the first part of the podcast with Dr. Jeff Torrent. Stay tuned for the second part of this fascinating conversation.